I'll invite you to turn with me to the book of Romans, the fourth chapter. The lectionary is actually going to have us in the book of Romans for 16 weeks throughout the summer months. So here is the invitation. There's 16 chapters in Romans. By my math, that's one chapter a week will get you through it. So let me invite you that every week to read one chapter in Romans. It's actually, some have described it as the fifth gospel. But it's interesting, it was the gospel written before any of the other gospels. It was actually before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written. And what you're going to find is that this gospel, this Romans letter is a little different than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for they have deep narratives, lots of stories. What you're going to find is that the Apostle Paul uses deep sentences. In 16 weeks, you're going to love run-on sentences. You are. You're going to embrace them. The Apostle Paul did not ever see a comma that he didn't enjoy, and that's why I love him so much. Uh, Let me pick up in verse 18, as Jeff has already read the first couple of verses. Hoping against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to the death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for your great examples of faith that have been lived before us. May you continue to grow ours even in the midst of this moment. Thank you for already speaking. Continue to speak. Give us ears to hear. Hearts that would be courageous to follow you wherever it is you're calling us this day. For it is in your good name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm so grateful for Gary Graves for being our song leader for the day and pitching in and, and helping as, as Brock is traveling. And he and Jennifer had a very busy week at annual conference as they were in charge of so many things, including a registration, which I'm sure was just a lot, a lot, a lot of work, particularly this, this time. And so just thank you for that, for your service in so many ways. And, uh, to appreciate it. And I got to see Jennifer all week, and that always just makes my whole whole life better. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the phrase that has captured me from Romans 4, hoping against hope. What does that mean? <laughs> it, it almost seems to not mean anything, hoping against hope. It actually is a phrase from Romans 4.18 that came into kind of our... Um, our language in 1813, it was beginning to be used then. And it simply means that when we face a situation that it doesn't seem that there's any reason to have hope or conviction that things are going to turn out okay, that we continue to hope. Abraham hoped against hope. It's those situations in life that seem like they already are foregone conclusions. Why would you even waste your breath? And yet we hope against hope that things might turn out differently. Abraham and Sarah, their whole story is a hope against hope story. You know, the promise that God gave to them was that you're going to be a mighty nation and through you, all other nations will be blessed. A couple of problems with that. (laughs) Abraham was 100 years old. He and Sarah did not have children up to that point. Now, now think about it. You go home and God meets you in your driveway as you walk in and says to you, oh, by the way, I've got this major plan that seems completely impossible. What do you do? Abraham hoped against hope. He hoped against hope. There was no reason... To believe that anything was going to come to fruition. I mean, let's face it, at this point, 
probably was more worried about retirement than he was putting down roots, getting involved in something. And yet God shows up and provides this impossible promise. And Abraham hoped against hope. I've needed this word this week in particular. Maybe you do too. I bet we've all faced situations at some point in our lives, maybe it was a broken relationship that you're like, this is never going to get better. I might as well just move on at this point. That would have been a situation that you could hope against hope. Or maybe you received a diagnosis or a loved one did. But you're like, this is overwhelming. Where do we even go from here? And you were faced with the reality that you could either give up or you could hope against hope. Maybe you're part of a denomination that seems like the only news is bad news recently. Nobody in here is a part of that. But, you know, let's say we were. Maybe it's up to us to hope against hope. I needed this word this week. Isn't it interesting how God works? The lectionary has put before us on a three-year cycle. And on this Sunday, of all Sundays, the message is to hope against hope. It's like God knew this is the word that we needed. Amen. How do we hope against hope? I mean, let's face it. We all need, we all have the situations that we're going to be faced with. Like, what do I do now? It seems impossible. It almost seems silly for me to continue to hang on. How do we hope against hope? And I think Abraham gives us a wonderful example of what that looks like. The first thing that we do to hope against hope is we focus on the promises, not the problems. We focus on the promises, not the problems. Abraham had lots of problems around this promise. <laughs> he had lots of things that could have distracted him, that could have, could have uh, kind of pushed him away and down. And yet he didn't. He, didn't, he chose to not focus on the problems but on the promise giver. And it's so interesting to me that, that Abraham did not have a Bible that he could turn to every day and look at God's promises. It did not exist at that point. He didn't have a church that could gather every Sunday that we could encourage one another. He didn't have any of those things. All he had was a word from God. Maybe that's all we ever needed, a word from God. He had to cling to the promise giver. He had to know that what was being promised was going to be delivered. And so he hoped against hope. What do we do when that relationship seems so broken that there is no reason to go on? We could either focus on all the brokenness within it or we could hope against hope and cling to the one who says, I'm the great reconciler. I make all things right. And I can not only renew the face of the earth, I can renew the relationships in your life. What do we do when that diagnosis comes that's life-changing? Do we focus on the problem or do we focus on the great physician? If we focus on the great physician, we are hoping against hope. We're clinging to the one that can do something about our situation. We're all going to be there if we're not there, if we haven't been there. And we're going to have a choice. Do we allow the problems to overwhelm us and even cloud out where our help comes from? Or do we cling to the one who's given the promises It'll be the difference between hoping against hope and simply going your own way. Secondly, we acknowledge that God's power is doing the work and that there's a role for us in it. I've been thinking about this this week. There is no humanly possible way for Abraham and Sarah to have been pregnant at this point in life. Right? Am I right? And yet there was no way that 
God could provide a baby for them without using them. They had to be a part of it. Though they couldn't do it, and yet they had to be a part of it. That's a pretty powerful place to be, to acknowledge God's power and that there is a place for us in it. The, uh, the number 369 has a very soft place in my heart. Very soft place in my heart. In the uh, fall of 2006, you as a congregation sent 50 of us to the Andover community. And you sent us out and said, well, we've got this thing that is now a dance studio out there and we would like for it to be a worship community. And so there was 50 that went out and began to do all the things that you shouldn't to plan for a worshiping community. We did it all backwards. They say, don't focus on the building, focus on small groups and build them up. Do you know what we did? We focused on the building. You were so generous. You gave us 200,000 to fix up the building. And so from the basically December of 2006 to October, we worked feverishly paint and carpet and all sorts of things. And have you ever had a, a moment where the company's coming and you knew you weren't going to be ready? Yeah, that was my existence for about a year. Like, there's no way we're going to get this done. And we completely focused on that. That's not what you do when you start a new worshiping community. We, uh, I was sent to Atlanta to meet with a church planting expert. And so I went to Atlanta. And I'm going to save you the whole day's worth of conversation. You're welcome. Um, I went there, and two major things that this church expert on planting told us. Do not use an organ in your worship. I mean, can you, can you believe? I should have walked out the door right there. And number two, you're not the person, Todd, to do this. Like, whoa, this isn't good. I'm glad my Series 7 license isn't expired yet. He said, like, I don't ever hire type B people to plant churches. You always have to have a type A person. So I fly back to Atlanta ready to give my resignation and do something else. And we meet with the leadership team. I'm like, hey, look, two things. We're very clear. Can't do traditional worship. The organ's got to go. And, and I have to go. Those are the two takeaways. Fortunately, the leadership team and I agreed that traditional worship was sort of who we were at our core. So we're going to go with that. And that we would just hope that somehow I could pull it off. <laughs> that, that was a lot of confidence building. <laughs> Thirdly, we, uh, when you start a new church, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go out and door to door and tell people you're there. That's what you're supposed to do, door to door. I mean, all the church experts, they'll tell you that's what you're to do. Do you know what we did? We ran out of time, literally. We ran out of time. So here was our brilliant plan. We sent three postcards out with my face on it. <laughs> Can you imagine? Don't, just don't say it. Don't say it. My face on these postcards. God help us all at this point. October 7th, 2007 arrives. This type B guy is hiding in the back. I was not hoping against hope. I was planning my exit strategy because I knew no one was going to show up. We had done it all backwards. We had a beautiful building. We, but that was about it. At about 10.55, someone comes to get me and says, I need to make an announcement. And I figured the announcement was, everybody go downtown because there's only three of us here anyway, and we'll just go worship they said, we need you to go and tell people to scooch together. To scooch together. There's so many people. As I'm walking down the hall, I meet this gentleman who I'd never seen before. He's carrying chairs. His name was Rich Thomas, who I would come to know and love. Rich showed up that first Sunday, saw that we had run out of chairs, and was starting to just drag chairs out. We started worship that day, standing room only, 369 people. Praise be to God. We did everything backwards. It should not have happened. 
Acknowledge God's power and acknowledge that God wants to do and use you even as flawed as it possibly could be. That's what God does. That's how we can hope against hope. God can do whatever and will do whatever. Will we show up and offer whatever meager we have as backward as it is? Finally, we want to be a people who hope against hope. We need to be a people who get on God's side through faith. I submit to you this morning, we have over-spiritualized faith. Faith is simply getting in line behind Jesus Christ. That's all it is. Faith for Abraham was this. Abraham, I need you to move from Ur and the Chaldeans to Haran to the promised land. I just need you to move. I just need you to get in line behind me. And what did Abraham do? He moved. He, he aligned himself with the word of God and the promises. That's faith. That's faith. We, we've overcomplicated it. Faith is just simply choosing God above everything else. Every time you read your scripture and pray in the morning versus reading the paper and watching the news, guess what? You're exercising your faith. It's as simple as that. Every time you come to church, instead of the 50,000 things you could be doing, you exercise your faith. It's that simple. Every time you forgive, instead of hold on to hatred and bitterness, you exercise your faith. And I could go on and on. It's not rocket science. It is really difficult. But it's straightforward. It is getting in line behind Jesus. That's what faith is. And it can be really difficult at times. What do we do when the roadblocks come? Most of you may very well on your way home stop someplace to eat. That's a common occurrence I hear. When you stop to eat, have you ever pulled up to some place and, and gone through the drive through and, and it just works so smoothly. You pull up and you give your order and like two minutes later, you're already out and eating the extra fries that you bought that you could carry you over till you got home. You know you do that like I do. You buy a small fry to get you to the home. Have you ever had those experiences? Just, just so smooth. You just go straight through and you're out the door and it's just amazing. And then sometimes you pull up and the person in front of you, even though there's numbers on the board to tell you how to order, they begin to order things like a Chilito without Chilito sauce. And they order like a number three with a number six thing and a number eight with that. And, and you've been there, haven't you? And you're like, for the love of all that is good, please order by the numbers so we can move on. And you have a choice to make. Do you stay in line or do you exit and do something else? Here's the deal. Hoping against hope means we stay in the line regardless of how long it might take, regardless of how difficult it may be, regardless of how little results we're seeing. Hoping against hope is aligning with Jesus even when the results don't seem to be there. Jesus once said that it is more, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get to heaven. I believe you could substitute the word patient person in there as well. How often, how often do we get to the point where hope against hope just doesn't seem to be getting us anywhere and we get out of line and choose something else. It is about aligning ourselves with Jesus when it seems to be going well and when it seems to be difficult. That brings us to this place that God's work and God's power can be done. 
the greatest act of faith you will ever face in your life is the trust that you'll place in Jesus Christ is my prayer. That what he did in his life and death and resurrection is sufficient to reconcile you with God and to deliver you for eternity. It frees you literally from every bit of anxiety in this life. And it is the key to hoping against hope. It is the key to continuing to go further when all seems that you should just give up. Paul wrote this letter to the Romans, a group that he had never actually met. He had never been to Rome at this time. He wrote a letter to them and trying to discern what their needs were. I wrote a letter to you about three years ago, if not longer. And I've had it in my Bible. And I keep coming back to it every once in a while. And, and God's just been saying, nope, not time. Nope, not time. And I pulled it out yesterday and I got this overwhelming, it's time. Hear this letter about having hope against hope. Dearly beloved, I give thanks to God for you continually in my prayers. For your love of God and faithfulness to others continues in many and great ways. You refuse to lose faith in God and each other as you have faced head on these days of struggle that we have had. Your generosity has been given even more opportunities to shine as a witness and show the kind of stewards you are. There's not a moment I do not feel your prayers and know your encouragement. You have been knit together for such a time as this. You are ready to face the days ahead with boldness and compassion. The coming weeks, months, and years are as important to us as any time in our life. Things have changed. We've changed. The church has changed. But Jesus Christ remains the same. And you are as vital to our work of making disciples now as you have ever been. That was put on my heart a few years ago by the one who you never can go wrong hoping against hope with, the one that will always fulfill his promises, the one who not only we can trust our lives with, but this very place that we love so dear. Lord, thank you. For your promises are true. Your power is overwhelming and your grace is sufficient. Thank you for meeting us in every moment in our lives. Grow our faith, Lord, grow our faith. Help us to be a people who hope against hope. For we know that you can be trusted, for you have never failed. And it is in your name we pray.